Now it's my great pleasure to introduce our guest this evening, Jennifer Weiner, who is no stranger to the Free Library. Born in Louisiana, educated at Princeton, spending many summers on Cape Cod, and lucky for us, making her home here in Philadelphia, she happens to be the number one New York Times best-selling author of more than a dozen funny, fanciful, and extremely poignant novels, as described by the Boston Globe. These include That Summer, Who Do You Love, Mrs. Everything, All Fall Down, In Her Shoes, and Good in Bed, the book I spot on my daughter's bookshelf and had to read. <laughs> in addition, she has written several books for young adults, along with a collection of essays entitled Hungry Heart. Her other works have been published by the New York Times and Wall Street Journal. In this newest work, The Breakaway, Miss Weiner tells the story of Abby Stern, a woman who finds empowerment during a group bike ride from New York City to Niagara Falls. I know we are all eager to hear what she has to say this evening, so please join me in welcoming her to the stage. I brought my menopause fan. <laughs> Andy, um, who works at the Free Library, is like, is, is it, is there, are they like headphones? And I'm like, oh, you're so nice. You're so nice. I'm like, no, these are for sweaty 50-something ladies who are, who are going through it. Thank you. Yes. So the menopause fan. Um, my, my husband said there was a wire cutter article about people who've decided that being cool is more important than looking cool. <laughs> so now we're not married anymore. But... <laughs> um, welcome to pumpkin spice season. Yes. Did anybody else like walk into the Whole Foods and just get like blasted with like maple and cinnamon? I'm so happy because it means that like summer's ending, right? Because this summer was the worst. It was, it was the worst. Um, I'm, I'm gonna just tell you guys, I am gonna talk about the book, but first I have to tell, I have to vent a little bit about what I did on my summer vacation. I got invited to a wedding, okay? Um, my, my mom, Fran, her partner, Claire, of many years, Claire had been, before she was with Fran, with a previous partner, Deb. These are all lesbians with single-syllable names, so just, <laughs> you might want to write some of it down, okay? Claire and Deb had a child together, David, who is the nicest person in the world, and I feel very bad that I'm about to make fun of his wedding. Um, <laughs> Like, the kindest, sweetest, most helpful. He was my daughter Phoebe's Manny, right? He had, fin he had just graduated from college. He had no, he didn't have a job. He had no experience with children. But I'm like, well, he's the nicest guy in the world, so he's probably going to be better at this than I am. So I hired him, and um, Phoebe, Phoebe's here tonight. Where? Oh, she's over there. Hello, Phoebe. Yes, um, you can all, there, stare at Phoebe. She's 15, she loves it when people look at her. <laughs> um, Phoebe was born with hip dysplasia, which you've probably seen those babies that look like Frogger in the little splints with like their legs sort of pushed out sideways because their hip joints didn't form properly. Phoebe had a lot of problems as a baby. Like they handed her to me and I'm like, oh, she's beautiful. And then I noticed that she's doing this like hiccuping grunting thing. She's like, <laughs> And I'm like uh, waving to the doctor. I'm like, is this normal? They're like, no, actually it isn't. And they, they whisk her off. She had um, transient tachypnea of the newborn, which is basically what happens if you have a scheduled C-section and like your child does not get squeezed in a meaningful way. So there's still like fluid in their lungs that they have failed to expel. So like, you know, they take her to the, to the NICU where they discover that her hips are also fucked up. So I'm like... <laughs> I'm like, is this thing under warranty? Like, do I, is there? So David takes care of Phoebe and she's in her little splint. And like, every time I take her to chop to get the splint hoisted to keep her hips where they're supposed to be, the doctors are like, this is the cleanest and most immaculate hip splint we have ever seen. I'm like, I got nothing to do with it. It's, it's all David. So David is lovely. 
And um, David was dating Zoe when he was Phoebe's Manny. And so we, we all liked Zoe, but Zoe, alas, they were in their 20s. It, it did not take. And then David met Brett, and they <laughs> dated, and they got engaged. And everyone is so happy because David is like, he's a wonderful guy. He's going to be a wonderful father. And they invite us to their wedding. They live in Denver, Colorado, where they keep chickens. Um, David does video editing, and Brett did both Teach for America and the Peace Corps, just to give you a sense of the kind of people we're dealing with. She's a, she's a social worker. She works with um, neurodivergent adults, you know, another, like, fabulous, stellar, kindly, and good person, and I'm going to make fun of her, too, and I, I, I am sorry. So they, they send us, you know, the wedding website. They're getting married at a picnic area in a park in Denver at the top of a mountain. So they say, do not drive to the top of the mountain. There is no parking at the top of the mountain. We are hiring a shuttle bus to take everybody to the picnic area. You know, gather at this hotel. You're going to get on the shuttle bus. The bus is going to take you. And I'm like, okay, that, that sounds good. Little realizing that, that I will have no way off of this mountain once I'm up there. You know, I gotta wait for the shuttle bus to take me back down. So we're driving up and it's like twisty and it's turny and it's curvy. And I'm like getting like a little car sick. It's not good. And it's just, it's incredibly remote. It's very beautiful, but it's incredibly remote. And I'm like, this is when they start picking off the Jews. Like, this is, <laughs> this is like, they've got me up here, and now they're just going to, like, one by one by one, they're just going to, like, take us all out. And that was not what happened. Um, you know, so, like, Claire is there, Deb is there, Claire's new um, partner, Larry, is there, L-A-R-I. My dad's name was Larry, so this is all very weird for me. <clears throat> so um, they, and, and it, it's really, really lovely, but this is the kind of wedding where like they give you like a metal cup on a carabiner as your favor and also as your cup. <laughs> and this is gonna be your cup for lemonade and for the champagne toast and for the wine and beer with dinner and for the ice cream for dessert. <laughs> You don't get to rinse it because Mother Earth doesn't like that, okay? Like, you're, you're not going to despoil the environment with, you know, soap or anything like that. So I'm, I'm holding my cup on the carabiner, and they, you know, the service is in the Aspen Grove, and it's really beautiful. And they ask us all to pick up a rock and hold it. And I'm like, please tell me we're going to get to throw this at some <laughs> But no, you don't get to throw the rock. You're supposed to hold the rock, and Phoebe, what are you supposed to do? Imbue the rock with love, right? <laughs> so Phoebe's holding the rock, and she's like, I think I've imbued it all I can. Here, you imbue it now. So like, so, so I'm, I'm holding. And then after we imbue the rocks with love, we get to go back to the barn to paint them, because there's an arts and crafts portion of this wedding. <laughs> And they say barn, right? And I'm thinking, oh, barn, you know, like barn is just like a catch-all term for like a wooden, no, the barn's a barn, man. <laughs> there had been horses in there very, very recently. <laughs> and, and they've got like picnic tables set up with paint so we can paint the rocks that we've imbued with love. And, you know, at the, 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 the microphone stops working during the service. We don't hear David's vows. I mean, for all I know, he's up there, like, promising God even knows what. And then Steve, who is Claire's sister, Carla's partner, is, has gotten himself, like, ordained somehow for this thing. And, and he marries them, and he's like, you know, Deb is here, David's mother, Deb, David's other mother, Claire, Claire's partner, and he looks at this piece of paper, and I can just, I can feel the synapses firing as he's like, does this really say Larry? <laughs> Claire's partner, pause, 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 Larry? <laughs> and I see Larry, and she's trying to smile, but she's thinking, I'm going to end you <laughs> when this is over. So, you know, service happens, vows are said, everything is lovely. And then Steve says, and at 5.30, the taco truck will come. <laughs> now, remember Phoebe, my 15-year-old daughter? Phoebe's hungry. 
that's kind of her natural state. That's how I know she's my daughter. Phoebe is hungry. So, you know, they're like, oh, well, there's going to be like hors d'oeuvres, right? There's going to be like little, little nibblies. The nibblies are, I shit you not, grapes on a toothpick. <laughs> There are grapes on toothpicks, and there is hummus with carrot chips. No pita! Where's the pita? Carrot chips! So my husband, who likes this crap, is like, he's, he's perfectly happy. He's got his carabiner cup, and he's eating the hummus with the carrot chips. And Phoebe is seething. I'm not happy either. But, but I'm just, I'm kind of amused watching her. So like... We have been promised the taco truck at 5.30, right? At 5.15 or so, Phoebe finds the, the clearest sight line to the part of the parking lot where the taco truck is coming and posts up and starts watching. <laughs> she's in the barn, right? But she's not painting rocks anymore. She's just watching. 5.30 comes, there's no taco truck. 5.40 comes, there's no taco truck. 5.45 comes, and Phoebe looks at me, and she's like, which one of them am I eating first? <laughs> I'm like, go for Deb. She looks chewy. <laughs> um, and, and so the taco truck finally rolls up, and, and you, if, if you were expecting, like, immediate tacos as I was, you would have been sad and disappointed because first they got to, like, open the taco truck windows, and then they start, like, bringing out tables, and then they start lighting grills. And I realize there's no fucking tacos in there. They're going to cook the tacos. We're going to be here all fucking night, and there's no way out. I can't leave. I am cursing my mother who's dead now. I'm like, God damn it, Fran, this is all your fault. So we wait and we wait and finally they're like, okay, if everyone could line up now to order your tacos, three tacos maximum. <laughs> Phoebe's like, I hate you so much right now. And, and, and the, the true hell of it, the tacos weren't good. The tacos weren't good, and they were tiny. They were like appetizer tacos. It was like the Woody Allen joke about the food is terrible and the portions are so small. Like, and, and so finally, like, my husband is like, and, and, you know, we had flown in the night before. We're still on East Coast time. We're exhausted. There are black flies. It's very earnest. I don't do well with earnestness. And my husband's like, you know, he's, he's like taking the reins at this point. He's like, we got to get out of here. So he goes to Claire and he's like, you know, I, I know that some people must have driven. Is there anybody who's planning on leaving early? She's like, oh, yeah, sure, Barb. I'm like, another fucking lesbian with a one-syllable name. What? Like... Are you not allowed to have longer ones? Like, what is going on? So, you know, we get in Barb's car, and Barb is fantastic. Barb saves our lives, and she's like, it turns out that she's like in her 70s, but she has a job delivering medication for a pharmacy, so she's like a really good driver. She's like very confident. She's like making good conversation, and I'm like, you know, so, so Barb, how do you know David and Brett? And she's like, oh, Deb and I used to date back in the day. I'm like, oh, of course you did. <laughs> Yeah, and she's like, how do you guys know David? And I'm like, oh, God, how do I explain this? And I'm like, well, Deb's, you know, Deb was with Claire, but then Claire, Claire and Deb broke up, and then, um, and then Claire was with my mom, Fran, and, and she's like, oh, I met Fran. Fran was fantastic. Fran was so funny, and Fran was so nice. And I'm like, Fran would have still been up there and not making fun of the shitty tacos. <laughs> I mean, and I felt, I felt bad. Um, I, we gave them a very nice present. I, I, I had bought them something already, but after this wedding, I like went back to the registry and like contributed to the charities they'd picked out, like all six of them. Um, <clears throat> so yeah, that, that, was, uh, that was my summer vacation. That was, that was July. It was, um, it was memorable. Like I, I always say like, you know, some things are fun and some things are just great stories. And I think that like that wedding is, you know, as the as time goes by and burnishes and erases the member of our gnawing hunger and our rage at the grapes on toothpicks. And I'm not even making this up. It was grapes on toothpicks, yes. It was a grape on a toothpick that had been made at the bride's house that afternoon. I'm like, you couldn't have even gone to Costco? Like, come on, they have good stuff. Ay, ay, ay.
All right, but I, I am. Um, I mostly want to take your questions because I, I always enjoy um, a, a more interactive experience. Um, so I'm going to tell you a little bit about the breakaway and how it came to be. And then you can ask me anything about this book, about previous books, about Fran and Claire and Deb and Pam <laughs> and Larry. What are the chances? guys that, you know, my mother's ex starts dating a woman whose name is the same name as my dad. Like, and what do I do with that? Because if I put it in a book, no one's going to believe it. <laughs> They're going to be like, yeah, right. So, okay, the breakaway. Um, when I moved to Philadelphia, lo these many years ago, I, I came here in the 1990s. I didn't know anyone. I didn't know the city. This was the biggest city I'd ever lived in. And I started riding my bike with the Bicycle Club of Philadelphia. I met people, I got outside, I learned my way around, I, I found the drives, I found the Schuylkill Path, I rode all the way to Valley Forge. I would go on rides, you know, two hours, three hours on weekends, and then like rides that lasted days, rides that lasted weeks. And I, I loved it. I really, really loved it. I always loved riding my bike. I loved the sense of independence and adventure and being able to get someplace on your own power. Like, all of it made me happy. Then I got married, and then I had babies, and I found that leaving the house for two or three or four hours is incompatible with newborns. <laughs> the authorities tend to frown. You can't really do that anymore. You can't just, like, take off. And so, you know, I started, like, going to yoga, going to step class, going to bar class, going to boot camp. And my bike just kind of sat in my basement, and the tires went flat, and the bike got dusty. And I would look at it, and I would think, oh, you know, someday. And I had done, you know, little rides here and there. Like, I, I would put the, like, catamount on the back of my bike when my kids were little. And I'd be like, you're pedaling, aren't you? And, like, Lucy, my older one, would be like, yes, I'm pedaling. And I'd see her shadow, absolutely not pedaling. <laughs> just sitting there being, you know, ferried about by mom. So then the pandemic comes and the gyms close. You know, there's no yoga, there's no bar, there's no boot camp, there's no nothing. And I am somebody who exercises more for her mental health than her physical health. And I'm like, I have got to do something. Like, I need some exercise, I need some fresh air, I need to get out of this house, I need to have conversations with people who did not come from my body. Like, I just, it, it was all a lot, right? You know, the pandemic, it was a lot. So I go online and I look up the Bicycle Club of Philadelphia, which is still very much in existence, and they are leading rides every single day of the week, seven days a week. So I pump up my tires, and I get back out there and I start riding. And like the first 10 mile ride I did, like I thought my vagina would never forgive me. <laughs> I, I realized I was no longer in my 20s. Things hurt a lot, but you know, still she persisted. And I, I got those padded Lycra shorts that look like you're wearing a diaper. And I just, I, I threw dignity to the wind and I started riding, you know, 15 miles, 20 miles, 25 miles. Um, and biking got me through the pandemic. It got me through my mom's death. Um, my mom got, my mom died in the spring of 2021. She had pancreatic cancer and it was this nine week sort of from diagnosis to her death. It was very, very quick and brutal and awful and, that's not one of the illnesses that you want, like the long, lingering, drawn out. Like it was, it was a mercy the way it happened, but it was still, you know, it doesn't matter, I think, how old you are when you become someone who has, doesn't have a mother anymore. Um, it was really, really hard for me. And I think especially because my Nana, my mother's mother, had lived to be 101. Um, I like to say that she was pickled in the juices of her own unpleasantness. <laughs> yeah. She lived a long, long time, and she was completely sharp and extremely critical right up until the very end. 
And, you know, so, but it gave me this idea that, like, I would have my mother, like, my mom was in her 70s when her mom died. And I'm like, I will have years and years and years. And my daughters will have years and years of their granny franny. And, you know, my mom had taught my girls to swim. She had taught them to ride their bikes. She spent pretty much all summer, every summer with my girls. She was a wonderful grandmother. And I think that as hard as it was for me to lose my mom, I think watching my girls lose their grandmother was the really hard part. And biking got me through it. Um, I, I went on rides with the bicycle club. I did rides by myself. I rode from Pittsburgh to Washington, D.C. the summer of 2021. There are trails you can do that on. You're not on the highway. Um, I did an event with Jenna Bush Hager a while ago, and I rode my bike to it. It was just in New Newtown, so it wasn't even that far. But she's like, how did you get here? And I'm like, I rode my bike. She's like, on the highway? And I'm like, do you see bikers on 95? Like, no, Jenna Bush Hager, no. I rode the side roads, um, you know, so I, um, I, I rode um, the Gap Trail, which goes from Pittsburgh to Cumberland, Maryland, and then the CNO Canal tra Trail, which goes from Cumberland to Washington, D.C. And then last summer, I rode from Albany to Buffalo, New York, which is the Erie Canal, sort of, you follow that along. And then during the pandemic, they opened the Empire State Trail, which runs from New York City all the way to Canada. You can ride your bike all the way to Niagara Falls. And I knew I wanted to write a story about a girl on a bike ride. I knew that was the route she was going to take, even though my editor's like, well, don't you want to set the book in Tuscany or someplace like that? And I was like, hmm, do I? But then I was like, no, like, this is where I rode. And I, you know, it's, it's not Tuscany, but it is very appealing. And I know I can make it sound wonderful. So I knew I wanted to write about a bunch of people on a bike trip because I had done so much biking because I found that when you're on a bike trip, things get really intimate really quickly. Like the people who are strangers at the start of a 40 mile bike ride, by the end of it, you are gonna know things about them. Like you don't even know about your own family sometimes. So I started thinking, okay, if this is my story, who are my characters? And I, as, as usually happens, I start hearing someone's voice in my head, which I know makes me sound like a crazy person, but this is what happens. I start hearing a character's voice. And in the case of The Breakaway, it's this young woman named Abby. And Abby's in her early 30s. She is um, a larger bodied person who is working to kind of make peace with that in the world of diet culture and a mother who's been very judgmental and very critical and has sort of watched every bite of food she's ever put into her mouth and who sent Abby to fat camp when she was a teenager when all she wanted to do was go to drama camp. And Abby is with her summer camp boyfriend, Mark, who has like lost half of his, you know, he's, he's one of these half his size people, but he, he loves her, he supports her, he believes in her, and, and she's like 90% of the way like, yes, this is the person I'm going to be with forever, but she's not quite there yet. And when she gets a chance, when her friend says, will you lead this bike trip, you know, this two-week thing, this bunch of strangers from New York City to Canada, Abby's like, yes, I will do this because this will give me time to think and time to figure out, you know, am I, am I going to marry this guy or am I not going to marry this guy? And she shows up, and I, I think that um, sometimes my instinct as a writer is a little bit like, you know, what is the worst thing I can do to my characters? What is the worst thing I can put them through? And so with Abby, I'm like, okay, so she's gonna lead this bike trip. What's the worst thing that can happen? Oh, her mother shows up on the bike trip. And is like, oh, honey, I just wanna spend time with you. We never spend time together anymore. And Abby's like, that's on purpose. But, you know, so there's Eileen in her like brand new everything, her brand new bike, her brand new, brand new gear. And then I'm like, but can I make it any worse? And I'm like, okay, what if this like really hot guy that Abby like 
spent one like delirious night of pleasure with three years ago, sorry Phoebe. Um, like what if he shows up on the trip too and, and her mom is there and she has to like figure this whole thing out and I'm like, okay, now we're, now we're cooking with gas. And so that became the breakaway. And so you're gonna meet Abby, you're gonna meet her mom Eileen, you're gonna meet Mark, you're gonna meet Sebastian, the cute guy, you're gonna meet all of these other people on the trip, including the four elderly riders who call themselves the Spoken Four, Spoke in Four. <laughs> And, and they wear matching jerseys every day. And um, I mean, that was a lot of fun too, like sort of going through the people that you always meet on a bike ride. Um, you know, like the guy who truly believes that traffic laws apply to everyone but him. And it's just, he's gonna ride wherever he wants to, like no matter what. And, and then the guy who's like Garmin device, like a Garmin is, it's like this computer that cyclists put on their bikes and it, it can tell you how fast you're going and there's like maps on it and like where you are and your cadence count, how many times you're pedaling per minute and like the weather report and like the star, you know, the star charts and like it just like beeps and boops and beeps and boops and it does not stop beeping and booping. And you're always behind that guy. No matter where you go or what you do, you will be behind him listening to all the beeps and boops as you go. Um, you know, and then there's like the, the used to guy, like 30 years ago, he used to be a lot faster than this. And, you know, he has not replaced his Lycra bike shorts in 30 years. He really should have. You're going to be behind him too. <clears throat> So, you know, I wanted to write about Abby and this journey and the people that she meets and the freedom that biking gives to, to people and to especially women. Because as I started writing, I, I knew that one of the places, because I did this ride myself, you go through Seneca Falls, where the Women's Declaration of Independence was signed. And a lot of these suffragettes were lady cyclists. And Along with the rise of the lady cyclists, there was like a lot of really anti-cycling misogyny. There were men, you know, prominent men, professors saying, cycling is bad for women, it's unnatural, it, it freezes their faces into ugly expressions called cyclist face. <laughs> Seriously, like you can look this up, people said this. And it turns out that like, the issue wasn't like, you know, women who weren't wearing skirts but were wearing bloomers. It, it was the idea that these women did not have to wait to be taken somewhere. If you were a lady with a bike, you could go by yourself, right? And the patriarchy did not like that, you know, any more than the patriarchy likes the freedoms that women have or had these days. And so it just all felt very relevant and, and very immediate and personal and important, you know, because I was writing this in the pandemic, I was writing this in the wake of the Dobbs decision, and we all know what that did, and I was thinking about um, women's freedom, women's independence, um, who is there supporting it, who is trying to take it away, what motivates these people, and you know, in the character of this woman, Abby, sort of what does freedom look like, what does independence look like, what does a happy ending look like? So those are the themes, those are the characters, that is what I did on my summer vacation. And now if any of you guys wanna ask about this book, other books, anything at all, um, I, am, I am here for you, so. How much was I involved with the making of In Her Shoes? Um, so, in Her Shoes was my second novel. It was turned into a, a movie that came out in 2006. Um, and it was one of the rare mentally healthy moments of my life where I was like, I am just gonna let that be the filmmaker's story to tell. Like, I am not gonna make myself crazy trying to micromanage or get them to listen to me or like try to tell them who I think they should cast or what I think they should do. Like, I, you know, like every, Every word I wrote has been published. Nobody's gonna go start changing the book, even after the movie comes out. Like, I've done my job, I've had my say, and I'm gonna let the movie be their story to tell now. Um, and, 
And now that I know other writers who have their things optioned, like, I give them that advice. I'm like, you know, yes, like, go watch them film, like, be part of it. But, you know, I, I, I know that there are novelists who've adapted their own material successfully. Um, one of my friends is a film critic, and she told me that a novelist trying to adapt her own material is like a mother trying to circumcise her own son. <laughs> She said, if you're smart, you let someone else do the cutting. <laughs> because that's what it is. Like, taking a 400-page novel and turning it into, like, a 90-minute movie, it's cut, cut, cut. And, of course, you know, if you're the one who came up with all that stuff, you don't want to let any of it go. So I, I really wasn't involved. I was just somebody sort of rooting from the sidelines. But I was really, really pleased with how it turned out. Did they ask me if I wanted changes or no, no, they asked me nothing, but I, I told them not to. I'm just like, you know, just do, do your thing. I mean, they, they had a really excellent screenwriter. She did a really excellent job and I trusted her and was just sort of on to the next thing, which I think was the smartest thing to do. First of all, it's fun to hear you talk about cycling because I'm a cyclist and it's such a microcosm of life. Yes. I think you really have to get into it to understand that. So thank you. But my question is about your writing. Do you discipline yourself to write every day, or how do you go about writing books? Oh, okay, so this is the process question. This is the what is my process, right? Um, I, I love this question, because I don't know if any of you guys are old enough to remember James Lipton on Inside the Actors Studio, who asked this question every single person, every guest he ever had on, whether it was Meryl Streep or J-Lo. He would be like, what, and, and with equal degree of respectfulness for every single person, what is your process? You know, and it was, I, I always enjoyed that about him. He was, you know, so it would be like Melanie Griffith, and, you know, she was, like, talking, there to talk about, like, milk money, and he'd be like, what is your process? I'd be like, James, she's a hoe in a tree. Like, <laughs> process. Her parents were famous. How about that? No, I <laughs> should but. Okay, so um, I, I write pretty much every day. I have an office um, in my closet. The big joke in my family was that my mom came out of the closet. I went in. Um, and I used to write at this like little, it was like a vanity. It, it's where a fancy lady who knows how to do makeup would have done her makeup. I am not a makeup person, so I would just like set my laptop up my laptop there and that was where I would write and then when the pandemic happened I'm like you know what like this closet is ridiculous like it's my my closet it's basically the like the sex in the city the first movie Mr. Big and Carrie move into that apartment and he gifts her this like crazy closet like that's the closet in my house except I do not have the Carrie Bradshaw wardrobe or shoe collection so it just turned into this like library kind of space and then I had a little office made during the pandemic, and that is where I write. And I write five or six days a week, usually three or four hours at a time. Somebody yesterday at my event asked, like, are you a morning person or a night person? And I'm like, I am, I am neither of those things. I am, a, I am a 10 in the morning to a 2 in the afternoon person. Like, that's my sweet spot. I, I don't get up early. I don't stay up late. But, um, you know, and people sort of seem to think that like there's superhuman levels of discipline required. But the thing is, I love writing. I've always loved writing. It's always been the thing that made me happiest and the way I made sense of the world. And also the only thing I was ever good at. So it all kind of worked out. Um, and I like it. Like I'm always, I, I knock on wood, I've never had writer's block, although I think a lot of that has to do with like a background in journalism where you're really not allowed to have writer's block unless you want to be like an unemployed journalist. Um, but I write, you know, five or six days a week, three or four hours at a time. I usually have an outline. The finished product usually does not have much to do with that outline. I go off course a little bit, but that's how it gets done. Hi. Hello. Um, well, as you were talking, I thought of a question. So I'm a high school English teacher. Mm -hmm. And how much, when you were in high school, did you know you were, wanted to be a writer? Did you have teachers that <clears throat> influenced that? 
Yeah, I mean, so like I said, I I think as soon as I realized that like writing was a career that was available to living people, that was something I wanted. Like as soon as I realized that people who wrote books like walked among us and, you know, that that this was something I could do, that was what I wanted. And I was very, very lucky because I did have teachers who encouraged me the whole way through. I went to public schools in Connecticut and I, you know, from the time I was like in first grade, I remember my teacher like giving me extra paper and letting me stay in from recess, which was good because like, I loved writing and I did not get along with other kids at that point in my life. That took a little while, but you know, I, I always, I, but the other thing is this, before I was a writer, I was a reader. And when people ask like, what's your one piece of advice for people who want to write? I say, you have to read, you have to love stories and language and fiction and nonfiction and poetry and every kind of writing. And you know, you, you just have to like, fill up on words and go to your library, go to your bookstore, just read everything you can. Um, but I just, I feel incredibly, incredibly lucky that I had so many people who encouraged me and that I've gotten to make this my, my job. I feel lucky. Hi, I have two questions. The okay. first question are what are your favorite authors? Okay. And the second is, a couple weeks ago, did you do the Naked Philadelphia Free <laughs> Okay, you know my kids here, right? <laughs> um, no, I, it was last weekend and I didn't even know it was happening until like every single person like on my publishing team is like, do you know about this? Are you doing this? Is there a cross promotional opportunity here? <laughs> I'm like, I don't know, can we buy space on people's bodies? Like, <laughs> read the breakaway? Like, I, I wish I'd thought of it sooner. I wish I'd known about it sooner. But like, I mean, honestly, like, I, um, I don't know. I, I feel as naked, as more naked than I want to be, just like in the Lycra shorts and the jerseys. So I don't think, I, I think that's as far as I'm going with it. Um, and as far as my favorite authors, I mean, I, there's so many writers that I love. Um, Susan Isaacs is one of my all-time favorites. I've read everything Stephen King has written. I like horror. Um, I, I read all of Diana Gabaldon's Outlander books when my mom was sick and in hospice, and I was going through that with her. And just being in the universe that, that, that those books created was so wonderful. Um, you know, I, my friend Curtis Sittenfeld's book, Romantic Comedy, which came out last spring, is one of my favorites. I thought that was so funny. Um, I, I love all of my Anne's, and Patchett, and Lamott, Anna Quinlan, um, all the Anne's. And God, I, I always get asked this question, and I always, always choke. And I, I, I'm reading like six things at a time. And someone's like, what are you reading? I'm like, uh, I know I'm reading something. Um, Trust by Hernan Diaz, which won the National Book Award. If any of you guys read that, it was one of the strangest books I've ever read. But it's a book that I find myself thinking about a lot, even though it's been months since I read it. And it's the story of a wealthy financier and his wife told through sort of four or five different lenses. There's his memoir that you're reading, and then you're reading a book about him, and then you're, you're reading things from other characters' perspectives. And it was just such a well-told story that made you think about money and, and narrative and sort of American myths. So I really, really liked that one. And I'm sure I'll think of more people like 10 minutes from now, <laughs> which is bad. <clears throat> Hello. Hi. Um, it's kind of, I guess it's a lot, it's a, it's a big question, but okay. you've written a lot of books, obviously. But yes. How do you feel like you have grown as a writer since your first book? Like, in what ways do you, like, I guess reinvent yourself mm -hmm. with each one? Like, how do you feel you've grown? That's a really good question. Um, I just had media training. And um, what the media trainer told me is like, okay, if somebody asks you something and you don't have an answer, what you should say is, that is such an interesting question. <laughs> and I am so glad you asked me that interesting question. 
and that we're talking about this interesting and necessary and vital topic <laughs> that you were kind enough to ask me about. Um, okay, so, um, wow. I, I always, my, my feeling is this, like, there's, you never write with as much freedom as you do when you're writing your first novel, okay? So like when I was writing my first novel, I didn't have an agent, I didn't have a publisher, I didn't have a lot of connections, nobody knew who I was. Um, I'd been, I was an English major in college, I'd published some short stories, I'd worked as a journalist for like seven or eight years, but you know, nobody was like breathlessly waiting to publish my debut novel which meant that I could just like swing for the fences, I guess, and just really like say whatever I wanted to say and not worry about it because I'm like, well, this might not ever get published anyhow, so I can just like go for it. Um, and I think that the trick has been as the years go by and you start having readers and you start having, you know, you have an agent, you have a publisher, you have expectations, you have people waiting for your next book and are they gonna like it as much as the previous book and is it gonna be better or is it gonna disappoint them? You have to find a way to put all of that aside and just have it be you and the story that you're telling. And I, I hope I've gotten better in terms of, you know, in terms of language, in terms of plot, in terms of character, in terms of pacing, in terms of all of the things that make a novel work. But I think that as, as I've gotten better at those things, I hope the thing that hasn't changed is just like the idea that like what matters is the story and how authentically I can tell it. And I think just like being in that little office closet by myself, it's like, I, for whatever reason, and I feel very lucky about this, but I'm still able to just sort of like lock in on like, this is a story that I'm telling myself, right? Because every writer is her own first reader. So it's like, okay, what do I care about? What do I think? What do I want to read about? What do I hope happens for these people? And just sort of stay connected to that. So I hope that was a good or somewhat coherent answer. I mean, but yes, thank you for asking that excellent and very <laughs> provocative question. <laughs> um, first, I want to say I'm sorry about your mother. Thank you. Yeah, I knew she was a big part of your life. Um, when you're, a couple questions. When you're riding, like when you were riding your bike, did you have a um, tape recorder with you? That <laughs> like, hey, this would be a good, Thing, or do you just? Um, so usually, um, I, I find that people tend to get a little defensive and quiet if they think you're taking notes. Um, <laughs> so I, I just try to like remember what people are saying. But when I was writing, like I knew that when I rode the section of the trail that starts in New York City and is very like trafficy and very scenic, like I knew there were details that I wanted to mention. So I had like my voice memo recorder on my phone, which is like clipped to my handlebars. And it is, it is literally the saddest thing because it's like gasp, gasp, bridge. <laughs> gasp, gasp. Guy on unicycle just almost hit me, holy shit! Like, you know, it's, it's just one of these like sad documents that you hope like nobody ever discovers after your death kind of thing. But yes, I did actually have a tape recorder at some point. But um, yeah, mostly it's just paying attention. Um, Although, like, I did, a after People in the Bicycle Club start, after word kind of got out that I was writing a novel, I started asking people, like, what is the, the most, the, the funniest thing, the saddest thing, the most outrageous thing you've ever seen, like, on a group ride? Um, and I actually did hear a story that made its way into the novel, which is a woman who was leading a cross-country trip. And one morning, this was a camping trip. This is not the kind of trip that I would do. Um, I am too old to sleep on the ground. But it was, you know, everybody was intense. And so the leader's like, okay, you know, everybody get up at 7 and we'll have breakfast. And, you know, 7.30, one of the tents is still zipped. And she's, like, calling and making lots of noise and finally unzips it, only to discover that the rider has expired during the night. Yes. Right. So, like, what do you do? And I'm like, just ride away really fast. And she's like, no. <laughs> No, that is not what you do. And I'm like, okay. 
I guess you're supposed to call the authorities or something, but so yes. Um, but yeah, I mean, sometimes there is something that's so good that you just, you know, you do have to like leave yourself a voice memo or something like that. And so, also, yeah. um, when you, well, I read Good in Bed when I was nursing, and when I got to the end, I would only read like one page a night because I just really just didn't want it to end. Oh, thank um, you. Do you miss your characters? Because they became my friends. Yeah. In that time. I, th thank you for saying that. And yes, I, I do miss my characters and sometimes wonder what they're up to and sometimes imagine things that are happening to them and think about revisiting them again at some point. But thank you so much. I mean, that... That really means a lot because I always, you know, people are like, you know, what, what, what is your hope for this book? Like, what is, what is your message? What are you trying to say? And I'm like, that is such a good question. And thank you for asking. But like, honestly, like, I want my books to feel like good company. And if that's how, if that's what happened, then that worked. So thank you very much for saying that. That means I did my job. Thank you. Hello. Hi. I've, I've read all your books, but I just read Hungry Heart, and that is my absolute favorite. Thank you. Tell us about your feelings when you were writing that book and your motivation. Okay, so Hungry Heart is my nonfiction um, essay collection. Please don't call it a memoir because I was told, like, you should call this an essay collection and not a memoir because, like, there's a certain attitude about memoirs by by women so I'm like okay fine it's an essay collection I don't really know but um you know it's um I some of those were pieces I'd published other places before some of them were you know things I'd thought about or had had written about but I I guess um one of the things I think about in in my writing in my storytelling um fiction or non-fiction like the idea that I want to tell stories that make people feel less alone or less freakish or less like I am the only person this has ever happened to and no one will ever understand it, so I better not ever tell anyone, right? Um, you know, like when, when my mom fell in love with Karen, her first girlfriend, when I was in my 20s and my mom was in her 50s, um, Karen, who she met at the swimming pool of the West Hartford JCC, where I never went back in the water again, <laughs> ever. My mom would be like, Jenny, it's not catching. <laughs> and I'd be like, they don't know that yet, for sure. But, um, you know, it was like, it, and, and um, this was like 30 years ago. It was, it was, it was a bit of a different time. And I think like there was a lot of people talking about like what to do if your kid comes out, like how to handle it. But like nobody was really talking about what to do if your parent comes out and is suddenly having this like much more like interesting love life than you are. And you know, I would talk about it with my siblings and um, you know, I, my, my youngest brother, Joe, was in college when this happened. And I remember I was at the Philadelphia Inquirer where I worked at the time and my phone rings and I'm like, features, this is Jennifer and it's my brother, Joe. He's like, do you know there's a woman living here? And I'm like, what are you talking about? And he's like, well, I went to Fran's bathroom to get her toenail clippers and there's all these love letters and they're from this woman and they say things like, Fran, after six months, the fire still burns. Um, <laughs> Karen was a smoker. And I'm like, I, I, I do not know about this, and let me call mom and ask her. And so I call mom, and I'm like, uh, Joe says there's a woman living in the house. I don't mention the love letters. I'm just like, he says there's shoes he doesn't recognize or something. And she's like, that's my swim coach. That's Karen, my swim coach. And she's just like staying here for a little while. And I'm like, Fran, it's not an Olympic year. Like, what is going on? You know, and then she's like, well, Karen and I met, and we're in love, and we're living together. Bye. And I, I what just happened, you know? And, and I, I, I think, like, my, my siblings and I would talk about it, and we would joke about it, and it was kind of like whistling in the dark. Um, but, like, with that story, with the story of, like, how my parents' marriage ended and what happened with my dad, 
I, I think that there are things where, whether there's shame or, or you just feel like an outlier, right? Like, I am the only one that this has ever, ever happened to. I am the only one who has ever felt like this. Like, I am the only one, you know, where there were like, five Jennifers in every class I ever was in all through elementary school, middle school, and high school. So I was always like the fat Jenny, which I did not like. And you know, like, but you feel like you're this freak. And what I've come to realize, and what I think I came to realize a lot writing Hungry Heart is that like, when you tell those stories, they lose their power to hurt you. And you find that there are lots of people who feel the same way that you do. And you're not alone like you thought you were. And so that's why I wanted to write that book. That's how I felt about writing that book. And, you know, I, I, I think if, if there's even one person who feels more seen and less alone by something that I've written, like that will mean that I am doing the thing that I'm supposed to be doing in the world. So that makes me happy. So I've been sitting here, and my throat is now dry because I've been preparing my question while everybody else is answering the <laughs> question. All right, OK, I'm ready. It sort of has morphed. But um, so my condolence to you on the loss of your mother. I lost mine um, within the last five years and in my late 40s. And um, I wonder if you would ever sort of step out of your own box as a writer, and you, you tackle so many women's issues and you know some middle-aged women's issues. Would, would this be a story that you would tell about you know, losing your mom and how looking forward um, life is for us motherless daughters? Yeah, that's, that's a, I mean, I have written about it some. Um, I wrote, an essay in the Times about riding my bike through my mom's death and how she was the one who taught me to ride a bike and how she was also the one who sort of taught me that like physical activity is like an antidote to grief. Like if you can get your body moving, you can sort of push yourself past pain, you know, where like you can turn your brain off at least a little bit, at least for a little while, and you can, you can have some peace in your own skin. So I, I wrote about that, and that was like a, a very um, well-received essay, um, and I, I sort of reworked it a little bit. Um, Target is selling a special edition of The Breakaway, and there's a version of that essay in the back of it. But yes, I mean, I, there, there's a lot of good writing about motherless daughters, and I, I would have to... I would want to believe that I had something unique to say that hadn't been said better by somebody else. But I think like the experience of sort of having my mom die, sending my older daughter off to college um, a couple months after that happened, and you know my my younger daughter's in high school, so like I you know the empty nest is is looming. Um, and just sort of thinking about that moment of womanhood where it's like you're not one thing, you're you're not, you know, you're not the mother of babies or young children or or middle school kids anymore. You know, your kids are becoming adults, your parents are either aging or dying or gone, and like where do you fit in the world at that point? And I don't know whether it would be a novel or nonfiction, but yeah, that is something that I think about a lot. So yeah, so stay tuned. Thank you for your book, In Her Shoes. You got me into reading. Oh, yay. yay. I never read a book before like that. I have every single one of your books. You are phenomenal. If you could choose another book to be a movie, which one do you think you would do? Oh, wow. Oh, that is a good question. OK, so Good in Bed has been optioned like a million zillion times, yes. Except I'm just going to say hashtag. Um, there, there used to be like four actresses in Hollywood who were maybe the right size. And now I feel like you'd need to staple three of them together. <laughs> Um, I don't know what is going on out there. I, um, and it's really hard. Um, but yeah, I mean, I, you know, that's, 
Good in Bed is the first book I wrote. It will always have a special place in my heart. Um, you know, but I also, I think the breakaway would be a lot of fun, especially because like there's, people would get to see like a larger woman leading a bike trip. Like how revolutionary would that be? Like that would be really fantastic. So, but the thing of it is like, I have found like for my own mental health, like the less thinking I do about movies and options and Hollywood and is anything gonna happen, like the, the better it is for my sanity. Because it's like the thing they say, like if you can't control it, you shouldn't try to, you shouldn't expend a lot of mental energy on it. And, and that is like the granddaddy of things I can't control is does my stuff get optioned? Does, I, does my stuff get made? Will this strike ever end? Um, is everybody gonna be a size zero next year? Like, uh, you know, so, but I mean, I, if you could all keep a good thought for good in bed, maybe it will happen someday. So thank you for that. Um, should we do one, one more, and then I will go put my comfortable shoes on and sign all your books? Hi. Hi, Jen. I'm Sarah. This is Lib, my wife. Hello. <laughs> okay. Wait, you got two syllables, though. <laughs> you double dipped. <laughs> so we're going upstate next week. What are your best spots in New York on your ride? Oh, my God. My best spots in New York. I mean, it's there's so much that's really fantastic, but there's a restaurant called Sackett's Table in Seneca Falls. If you can go there, and then the Women's History Museum was so inspirational. Like, I felt like such a fangirl, but I'm like posing in front of the Susan B. Anthony statue and like taking selfies and stuff like that. So spend as much time in Seneca Falls as you can. That is my advice. Um, thank you all so much. This is fantastic. <laughs>